Well, let's just open and pray. I have a word for today and I have sorted Zoom out so we won't get knocked off over 40 minutes. Um, and I never preach long, so I'll never be more than 30 minutes when I preach. I have been, um, I'm that person who likes to get it out and, <laughs> and get through it in half an hour. But God, we just thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Jesus, for every single person in his church, London, every person on this chat, God. And we're so grateful for their lives and that every life counts. We thank you, God, that you are a God that heals. We continue to pray for healing. We pray for Darren where he's been tested positive for coronavirus. And I thank you, God, that we declare healing over his body in Jesus' name. And anyone else amongst us that may have the virus that we're unaware of, I thank you that we stand in the gap and we trust you, God, for supernatural healing. We know that healing is the children's bread, that you send forth your word and heal us. And we commit every person that's unwell to you. And we ask you for your supernatural power of healing to be made manifest in Jesus' name. God, I thank you that this would be a week where you would speak to us as we're fasting, that we'd be super sensitive to your Holy Spirit, that we'd be led by your Spirit, that we would hear your voice. Your word says your sheep hear your voice. And I thank you that we would be a people that hear your voice, oh God, and, and know exactly what it is you want to say to us and through us. And God, even in, in a normal church service, we would come to you and we wouldn't come empty handed. We would come and offer you our praise and worship. We would come and offer you our lives as living sacrifices. So right now, we just focus on you in our hearts and we do that, God. We offer our bodies to you as a living sacrifice. We thank you for what you accomplished on the cross, that for the joy set before you, you endured the cross. We thank you that you have chosen us to be in relationship with you, Jesus. We don't take that lightly. We're so, so grateful when so many people all around us are dying from coronavirus. We are so grateful that no matter what happens, we get to spend eternity in your presence, eternity with you, God. And that is no small feat. God, I thank you for every life, not only for healing, but for your presence to be made manifest in our lives, that we would be people led by your Holy Spirit, that we would know your Spirit, we'd be in relationship with your Holy Spirit. And I pray today as I minister your word, I would do so with your clarity, with your authority, with your anointing. I thank you that as I speak your word, your word would go out and not return void and accomplish that which you purpose it to accomplish. I thank you that our hearts would be soft and open to your word and that you would have your way in us and through us. And we just commit this next time, this time to you. And we just take authority over every strategy of the enemy assigned against us to steal, to kill, to destroy. Your, your word says in James that as we submit ourselves to God, we resist the enemy and he must flee. So we do that right now in Jesus' name. We submit our lives and we submit ourselves to you. We resist the strategies and plans of the enemy and we thank you that he must flee. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would have your way and you'd speak to each and every single one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. It's so weird with no one shouting back. Amen. But um, the title of my message today is Faith to Hear. And last week, for those of you who weren't at church um, on Zoom, I spoke about how we hear his voice in different ways God speaks to us and different ways we hear his voice. And the week before, I spoke about being led by the Holy Spirit. And I, I really believe uh, that in 2021, more than ever, we're going to have to be a people that know the Holy Spirit and we know how to hear his voice. And in and, and whatever capacity he speaks to us. But all of that starts with faith. And I want to look briefly at what is, you know, it's one thing to say, how do we hear the, hear the voice of God? But we actually have to have faith attached to it. Because if we hear God and God requires something of us, if we don't have faith attached to what God is saying to us, we're not going to obey that thing. That unbelief is going to get rooted in us and it's going to make room for us to question God and who God is. And, and you may not understand what I'm saying, but hopefully by the end of the sermon you do. But I want to look today at ha having faith to hear God's voice, the faith required to hear him, the faith required to be in relationship with him. And, you know, if you just go down to the basics of our faith in God, the basics of Christianity, we have to go, what is faith? And faith essentially is this, and in Hebrews 11 is the chapter of faith that says, now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. So you and I heard the truth of the gospel. Something within us responded to the truth of the gospel. That something was faith, and that faith required us to, to respond. You know, you can be born into a Christian family. That does not make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is when you and I hear the gospel and we respond in faith 
to the gospel. When we responded and we said, we lifted up our hand or whatever the, 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 the situation was, when we made a decision to make Jesus our Lord and Savior. Now, faith comes from the Greek word. The word faith comes from the Greek word pistis, okay? And that literally means to persuade, to believe, to have co conviction, to draw towards something. So faith is the firm belief where there's no natural evidence. So I, I know like I know certain things of God, even though I've got no evidence to show you. I might have life experience, but not evidence to show you that Jesus is real. That's, that's faith. It's because I hear the truth. And in my faith, I'm able to perceive and I'm able to believe and, and, and live it out, okay? In other words, we cannot see faith. Faith is something we believe within us. Faith is always in the present tense. You know, I can't say I have faith for something now if I don't. It might have been something I had faith for 100 years ago, but do I have faith for it today? Faith is something that's current. It's in the present tense, and it's what we hope for in faith is not perceived by any of our five senses. So when I'm trusting God for a miracle, I can't make it happen. I'm trusting in God to make it happen. If I can make it happen, that's not faith. Faith is saying, God, I am out of options. I can't make this happen. I'm putting my trust in you to do the supernatural. So faith will always, uh, will always, will most often require action of us throughout the word. We see God doing supernatural, extraordinary acts where only God can get the glory. But every single time, or 99% of the time, God required people to do something. So, for example, before Jesus turned the water to wine, he said to his servants, fill these jars with water. Now, he did something supernatural. He turned the water to wine, but he could have just gone, have wine. But no, he required them to fill it with water, and then he turned it to wine. When you see Jesus told the disciples to see, feed 5,000 men with two loaves and five loaves and two fish. They still had to take the little they had. They had to do something with it. And then God came in and did the supernatural. God told Joshua, walk around Jericho for seven days and on the seventh day, seven times, and then blow the trumpet. There was something they had to do. And then God came in and caused the walls of Jericho to come down and did something beyond their ability. With Moses at the Red Sea, God said to Moses, lift up your rod, and God parted the Red Sea. That's my favorite example. I often use it because I think it's such an easy thing to lift up your rod. But in the moment of standing there, think about Moses, okay? He's left, they've just escaped Egypt, okay? By the skin of their teeth, God has been, they've been allowed to escape Egypt. Suddenly, Pharaoh gets it, like, what have we done? How come we have let them go? So they start running, and they're literally at, at, the, at the Red Sea, and they can hear the nation behind them coming to chase them down. There's no other option, and God says to Moses, lift up your rod. And so as he lifts up his rod, he does it as an act of faith. It's the rod of authority, and then God parts the Red Sea. We all have something we have to lift up in order for God to come in and part the Red Sea. So faith requires action and and we see that in the book of james faith without action is dead we, we the two come together but that action is not what does the miracle god does the miracle the action is an action a seed of faith that we sow so why do we need faith faith is essential to our christian walk when you and i heard the gospel we 100 percent believe in faith, and that was our response. So the, the essence of our walk with God is faith. The, the decision I made to make Jesus my Lord and Savior began with faith. Then living out my relationship with Jesus, the, the living out faith is a, is a lifestyle of faith. I am faithful. I, I am led by the Spirit in faith. I do something in faith. Everything is, is faith. So for example, when I put money in the offering, and let's say I put 10 pounds in the offering, it's not about the amount, it's the, the faith attached to that seed that as I sow that seed into the offering, that God's going to multiply it in the future in his way. See, faith attached to something takes something ordinary and makes it extraordinary because God's hand is on that thing. So it says in Hebrews 11 verse 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And if you look at the root of every single sin, somehow unbelief is attached. You think about fear. Why do we fear? We fear in moments of fear. It's because we're not trusting God. We're trusting the situation. And so fear creeps in. So fear is the, the root of unbelief. Any sin we deal with, it's unbelief. Even look at the Garden of Eden. What did the, the devil said to, to Eve? 
did God really say? He was sowing a thought of unbelief. And because of her unbelief, she, she, she questioned and so sin began. So if you look at the, the root of sin, very often it's unbelief. So without faith, it's impossible to please God. And that is quite scary because sometimes we can go to God and pray and we're emotionally led in our prayers because our circumstances are negative, but we don't actually have the faith attached to that. And God is saying it, it, he wants faith. It's faith that pleases God, not emotion. It's faith, okay? So saving faith is that faith when we made a decision to, to serve God, that, that moment we made a decision to go from being unsaved to saved, that moment we made a decision to make Jesus our Lord and Savior. But living faith is faith for our everyday life. And it's the same as grace. You have grace that saves but grace that empowers you by the Holy Spirit to live out the things God has for you every day. But faith is like petrol. And, and, and Lauren gave me this example. Lauren in South Africa, it's the best example. You have a car with no petrol, the car ain't going anywhere. You need to fill it up regularly in order to move forward. That's exactly what faith is. You and I need to be faithful in order to move forward in what God has, has for us. And it's a basic principle of Christianity. So the question that everyone asks is this, how do you and I become people of faith? We know we've all made that decision. That's why we're here today. But how do we walk out that thing of being a person of faith? And it's simple. It says in Romans, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Faith comes from hearing and, hear, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. So in other words, faith comes from time in the word. That's how you and I build up our faith. So then when God speaks to us, and whether he speaks through his word or through his Holy Spirit or through dreams and visions, we have faith attached to God's ability to speak to us. And that can result in the action he requires of us. And even if the action is to rest, that still takes faith to do nothing sometimes. So I want to look at three points today. And my three points are... I wanted three W's. I just couldn't get that alliteration. So you're getting an M and two W's. Manor, wells, and wineskins. Um, and those are my, my three points. So my first point is this, is manor. When you look at the nation of Israel, and let me back, backtrack. Whenever you and I read the Old Testament, the Old Testament will always point us to Jesus. Every single page of the Old Testament is a prophetic thing of what is to come in Christ or what is yet to come in the second coming of Christ. Everything you read. So the more you and I dig into God's word, the more we dig into the, the Old Testament, we see God paving the way for the coming of the Messiah. So when you see the, 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 the manner, the supernatural provision of the manner, what happened? The nation of Israel, they left Egypt, okay? They were in bondage, they were in slavery. God raised up Moses to supernaturally deliver them. So Moses' job was to take them from bondage to the promised land. But going to the promised land, they had to go through the wilderness. They were in the wilderness for 40 years. It should have been a few, a few week journey, but what was meant to be a few weeks ended up being 40 years because they mumbled, they complained, they grumbled, they, they did everything wrong. And so an entire generation did not inherit the promised land. Only Joshua and Caleb and in the next generation. Because ultimately, and we read the story when the, the 12 spies went and 10 came back with a negative report, two came back with the positive report. But the 10 that came back with the negative report kind of stirred up the crowd and said, you don't want to go in there because of the giants. And rather than seeing God being bigger than the giants, what happened is they responded with a lack of faith. And so God said, okay, I'll give you what you want. You won't inherit the promised land. Because they were like, we don't want to go. We'd rather go back to bondage. So in the wilderness, what happened is God provided them every single day with manna. Manna was supernatural. It was from heaven. No one could make a plan to have it. And for six days, they collected manna every day. And on the sixth day, they, a double portion was allotted for them to collect. Because on the Sabbath, which was holy, they were not allowed to collect it. Okay. So when you look at manna, it was daily. And they couldn't keep, they couldn't be lazy. They couldn't keep yesterday's manna for tomorrow unless it was a Sabbath. But every, any other day, it would go off. So you couldn't go, oh, I'm going to go out and I'm collect a week's worth of manna and I'm going to live on that. No, God required them every day to go out and to collect the manna for that day, except on the Sabbath, okay? And what is amazing about this is that, you know, a lot of theologians have researched what they think man manna is, and many people say manna is just coriander seed. But essentially what manna was, it was supernatural. It fell from heaven. 
And it wasn't something they they could make happen. God make, made it happen. They didn't plant and reap a harvest of manna. God supernaturally provided manna every day for 40 years, despite the weather conditions, despite what was going on around them, God was able to provide. Now, the same is true for you and I. His manna is his word, because ultimately manna was speaking of Jesus. And if you read the scripture in John 6, it says this, what will the sign, uh, what sign then will you give that we will, may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So this is John 6, Jesus speaking. And then Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. And Jesus was referring from himself, referring to himself. He said, I am the true bread from heaven. Okay. So manna was supernatural. In other words, only God can give, can give it. And Jesus is supernatural. And Jesus is the word made flesh. And the word is manna today in 2021. So the word of God is the manna, it's supernatural from heaven today. So what I mean by that, when you look when you look at that illustration and pull it through, is that every single day, God will give us something supernatural through his word. And he will give you and he will give me exactly what we need through his word. But it means we've got to go out and collect it. Does that make sense? I can't just have a seven hour quiet time on Monday and hope that gets me through the week. Seeking his manna is a daily thing that we do because every day it's supernatural for you and I. And then what happens is, remember, how does faith come? It comes from hearing, comes from the word. So as you and I fill ourselves up on daily manna, our faith is built. And what God does, which is supernatural, no one can make it happen, is he fills your faith tank and where you need it to be filled. Does that make sense? So if I need faith that God is my healer, I'm gonna, God is going to highlight to me his healing power throughout the word. So whatever I put my focus on, whatever I worship, it's what I become in that. So I put my focus on Jesus, I become like Jesus. So as I'm focusing on his word, which is Christ, I'm going to become like him. So the same way manna was daily, you and I seek God in the manna. And Christ said, I am the bread of life. I am your daily manna. And we partake of Christ by partaking of his word. You know, Simon did a devotion earlier this week and he spoke about God's rhema word and the logos word. And, and, and I will simplify it for you. For me, the logos word is the word of God. It's, it's everything that's written in there. But the rhema word is what the Holy Spirit highlights today for you and I to absorb. That's what the rhema word is. What is God speaking to you? And we can all read the same chapter, but I guarantee you that every single one of us, God will say something different to us because he knows us individually. He knows what we're struggling with, what we're doing well with, what, what direction we need to go in. So he's going to highlight something different for me than to Derek or to Jeannie or to Brittany. Something different is going to come out because God is an individual God and a unique God that cares for every single one of us. So point one, our word is manna. It's daily. The same way the nation of Israel had to collect manna every day, we have to go partake of Christ in his word daily. And by that, we have faith to hear and therefore obey what God tells us to do. Number two, wells. Water well, a water well is an excavation structure created in the ground by digging, driving, and drilling to access groundwater deep underneath. Now think about this. Water wells are generally found in places where there's no access to water. It's deserted, it's dry ground. If you think of the middle of Africa, nothing. But suddenly when there's a well, where there's a well, there's community. Where there's a well, there's life. Where there's well, there's a harvest. Where there's well, people gather. Okay, so what happens with the well, and I know from when we went on many mission trips to Mozambique, that's actually kind of where we fell in love. Like the, the, where, where our mission base is in Mozam, there's a well. The entire community comes to that well they draw water, the kids play along the well, or the livestock come to the well. The well is the place where the community hang out, you know, and, and so we can't understand that because we just got our, our kitchens or our bathrooms, we turn on a tap. But in mid Middle Eastern times, if you had a well, you had wealth. If you had a well, you had land, you had wealth, you had community, you were able to provide for the people around you, okay? So a spring 
spring water was even more valuable than well water, but well value was a high commodity. So it was a rare commodity water in, in biblical times. It still is a rare commodity if you think about it. And spiritually speaking, what does that mean for you now? Now, when you read the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman in John 4, and if you've ever heard Sassy preach, it's a go-to scripture. She always reference the Samaritan woman. But the Samaritan woman's at the well, and Jesus completely violates all the Jewish traditions, okay? Jewish men weren't meant to speak to women. They weren't meant to speak to Samaritans. And he goes directly in and he engages with the Samaritan woman. And he says to her, she, she's digging water and he, make, he kind of forms a conversation with her. And he basically says to her, listen, he tells her a future and he says, I am the living water. I am the spring water. Water. I am greater than what you are able to get from this well. And, and he completely blows the mindset that she understood. But when a well was filled with dirt, okay, so come, just backtracking a bit. In biblical times, if you filled a well with dirt, it was an act of war. So you had a right in that moment to declare war on your, on your opposition. So if I went into your land, filled your well with dirt, I was declaring war on you. And the same is true that when our wells are polluted, that pr prophetically speaks of sin coming into our lives and polluting the pure, unadulterated word of God. So what does that mean practically for you and I? Often you hear people say, Dig your wells, dig your wells. And when I first got saved, it used to drive me nuts because I thought, what are they talking about? Dig your wells. You know, all the prophetic symbolism. I didn't grow up in the church, didn't understand it. But as I grew in the principles of God, I understood that in your dry place, in your place where you want your circumstance to change and you can't make it happen, the only thing you and I can do is go deeper. Go deeper in the things of God. Dig our wells. So in other words, dig into the word of God. Spend time with God. So when your circumstance is negative, you do what the word says. So in other words, when you and I have got so much to be ungrateful for, we choose to be grateful. When we want to mourn, we actually praise. We, we, you know, like we do the opposite of what we feel to do. When things are dry all around, we go deeper, we dig deeper, and we get into God's word. And there's moments in my life we have not wanted to do that. I've wanted to have a little self-pity tantrum and cry and complain and, and really like have a moan about my circumstance. And God has said to me, no, dig your well. Dig your well of praise. Dig your well of thanksgiving. Dig your well of worship. Dig your well. In other words, go deeper in God where you cannot change your circumstance. Only God can. But in that moment, all you and I have, and we all can get to these moments of life, in our lives where we can dig into God and find God in our situation. And there's moments where I have wanted to 100% run away from where I'm at in my life, but I've had no option. And all I've had, and a friend even gave me a picture, where I was hanging onto the altar of Jesus saying, God, I don't want to be here, but I'm here because of you. And I, and I encourage you, because I feel like for some of us in this room, that there's situations we don't want to be in. There's circumstances we don't want to be in, but we're in it. And we can't change it. All we can do is go deeper in God. How do we go deeper in God? We go deeper into his word. We study his word. We dig into his word. We dive into his word and let God speak to us. Because by digging into our wells and, and, and building deep wells, there's moments when that will come out and when we need it. Let me give you an example. When you do a year of Bible college, two years, three years of Bible college, you get what we call concentrated fire because you're sitting under the word for three, four hours a day. Now you think how one sermon can challenge you, transform you. It can do something within you. Now you double time that, quadruple time that you're in the word, you're in an environment where everyone's seeking God. God deals quickly and purposefully in those moments. And it really is amazing. Now you're not going to academically remember everything about Bible college. But 10 years later, when you've forgotten most of the stuff, God has done something in your spirit. You took that time to dig your wells, go into God. You sacrifice something to do Bible college. And 10 years time, suddenly something will arise. And those wells you dug in your three years of college or your one year of college or your term of college will come, spring up to life because you need that truth and that foundation you established in your life for the future. Does that make sense? So, so for me, there's moments where I learned in Bible college of God being my provider. 
had nothing, 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 nothing. Okay, I was poor, I didn't have a car. I used to walk to work and feel so sorry for myself. Like I really, really felt sorry that I didn't have a car. Now I wouldn't care, but back then I felt sorry for myself. And, but I, I was determined to stick it out and see, no, God is my provider. And I'm going to share some stories in the future. But if I didn't go through that time of Bible college, moments later, when we went through rough times again financially, I knew like I knew God would come through for me. But I was only able to walk through those times with success and authority because I'd had those times in Bible college, because I'd dug my wells and I stood my ground and I said, no, God, I'm trusting you to reveal yourself in these moments. So there's times where all you have is to dig deeper into God and see who he is in the situation and know that in the future, in the right time, those wells will come to pass. And what happens is, is your faith gets built. So remember, we're talking about hearing God, but having the faith to hear God. So the first thing is manna, it's supernatural, it's daily. The second thing is wells, digging your well deeper, especially when your circumstance is negative and the natural, when it's dry. And my third point is wineskins. And I don't like this one, <laughs> but it's a big one. Um, but wineskin speaks about being flexible. So in Matthew 9, 16, it says, no one sews a patch onto unshrunk cloth of an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do people pour wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskin will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. So a wineskin was the way they stored wine in the Old Testament, okay? So what would happen is when you pour wine, new wine into a wineskin, the wine is still fermenting. It's still releasing different gases. And with that, there's the expand and the contract, the expand and the contract. So the wineskin had to be flexible to allow for that movement of the wineskin. But an older wineskin that had had wine for many years had gone hard and it had gone a little bit crusty. So if something was put in and it was fermenting or gassy, it would explode. It would not hold that new wine. Now, what that speaks of, and, and you will often hear people saying, prophetically speaking, it's a new season. We've got to be a new wineskin. We've got to have a flexible heart. It speaks about you and I always being ready to be flexible, always being ready to learn and to be taught. And, you know, the thing about the church is the church is progressive. So think about Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., Martin Luther, the guy that headed up the Reformation, okay, in the 1700s. So he was a Catholic monk who had this moment with God, and suddenly God reveals to him the just shall live by faith, okay? And so he goes and hammers his thesis on the door, suffers incredible persecution, but that was the birthing of the Protestant church. But if the Protestant church stayed with Martin Luther, I wouldn't be preaching today, right? Because he had a big issue with women, Martin Luther. So as much as God used him powerfully to, to bring about the understanding that the just shall live by faith, there were still many more movements in the church that had to happen. Then there was an understanding of baptism is not sprinkling, it's a full immersion. And, and, and baptism became a huge issue in the church for a couple of hundred years. Then there was the understanding and, the, and God revealed. So with each person, God revealed a new thing. The in, uh, inflowing of the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? How does the Holy Spirit move? Then there was the restoration of the fivefold ministry. Now, and then there was a restoration of women in ministry. Then there's been a restoration of the nation of Israel. You see, the church is ever moving. It's progressive. It's moving forward, understanding where we stand. Now, if we have an old wineskin, what happens is when a new truth comes, and it's it's an old truth, but God brings revelation to it and understanding to it. We're not going to receive it if we have an old wine skin, we're inflexible. But when we're flexible and God reveals something, we're able to receive that truth. And often what happens is, is we receive a truth and God does amazing things in our life. And we think, that's it. That was my moment of spiritual growth. And so the church stops there because it was my moment. But actually... God is ever progressive. He's ever revealing truths to us that are all found in his word. But if you think about Jesus, Jesus was so ahead of his time. He wasn't prejudiced. He had no prejudice within him. That's why he could speak to Samaritan. He had no gender issues. Everything about Jesus liberated women. He did not at all bind them. Jesus understood the liberation of women. He, and, no, the, everything about him was ahead of time. When you study his life, he understood mercy, not sacrifice. He understood things that you and I, I feel like we're still catching up to what Jesus understood. 
And yet what happens is when a new truth comes in, if we're not flexible, and I can tell you honestly, there's been moments where I haven't been flexible in our own life, we miss out on what God wants to do in us and through us individually and corporately. And so we have to be a people that remain flexible to God's ever increasing of the church of Christ. And, and I don't feel like I'm doing this justice, but, what, but when you study church history, you get a bigger picture on where we're going. You see, ultimately, this is all going to be wrapped up. And we're going to go to heaven and we're going to worship with generations of people, with all colors, with all races, with all styles. You know, I've got to be honest, like, I, I never enjoyed the flag dancing, such as, um, the flag dancing, I'm going to say that. So Jethro comes from an NCMI background, New Covenant background. I don't come from that background. But when you go into an NCMI church back in the day, like Victory Faith and Pantan, they loved their flag dancing, okay? So there was the ribbons and the flags and the, you know, like the running around. And we had it for a little bit of church in Pantan, but I never forget this girl was in a wheelchair, so she couldn't dance. And she used to roll like this along the front with the wheelchair. And she had all her flags and she would roll her things and get going. And then the flags would come like this. And then once or twice, I got taken out by a flag. So I had a personal thing. Um, Katie and Darren might remember, and that flag would like hit me on the head in the middle of worship. I'd be like in the glory, and suddenly this flag would come. Okay, so I never loved the flag dancing, but it doesn't mean it doesn't mean the flag dancing wasn't of God, just because I personally didn't like it. And every now and then I think, oh God, let us not be the flag dancing church, please. Like it just it freaked me out. It was outside of my box of I'm not going to get a ribbon and do a little rhythmic gymnastics thing at the front. But it doesn't mean because I didn't like it, it wasn't God. And believe, and if one of you want to bring your ribbon and dance at church, go for it, you are released. But it's still something within me that doesn't like it. But it doesn't mean because I don't like it, it's not of God. And so I don't want myself to get in the way of what God is doing. Because if I'm a new wineskin, if my heart is new, I'll allow God to speak to me. And I've really had to learn over the years to always be flexible in my heart because God did so much in me in those early years of getting saved. That doesn't mean what was happening in the church between 1999 and 2004 is all that was happening. That was my spiritual time. That was my time of incredible transformation from where I'd come out of. But God is still moving. God is still working. And so I have to be flexible. So coming back to the conclusion is that faith comes from hearing and hearing comes from the word of God. Now, God speaks to us. We spoke about it last week in many different ways. But when God speaks, we have to have faith in what God is saying. Okay. And to have faith, the only way we get faith is through his word. And through his word in different ways. So whether it's daily, it's the manner. Whether it's you're in your dry season now and life is hard, your circumstance is negative, And all you can do is go deeper, dig deeper, dig your wells deeper. Or God is doing a new thing in and through you. And he wants to do new things, but you have to be flexible. You have to allow for change, which is not always easy. I think it's the hardest thing. But let God do it. Whatever it is, allow the Holy Spirit to come in and do it and stir up our faith to not only hear God and obey God. Because you know what? It takes incredible guts sometimes to be obedient to God. But if you've got faith, you'll have those guts. But if you don't have faith, we're always going to walk away from doing what God has required us to do. But if we have faith, it will be easy. God, I'm doing it, I'm giving it, I'm saying it, I'm encouraging it, whatever God requires of you, and then God will step in and do the rest. You see, I want us to be a people, we might be a small church in Kingston, but I want us to be a people, as small as we are, who lifts up our rod and God parts the Red Sea. And God does what only God does, and then he gets all the glory, not man. Amen.